person they can talk to about it and be like okay well this is what I think you know don't try to like the same music because one of your friends likes it don't try to listen to whatever is popular so you'll fit in that's what you find in metal you find self-confidence because it's a strong type of music that gives you you know the ability to stand up and go okay screw you you know I like this band. If you don't like it, too bad. Don't buy the album. Don't listen to it. Uh, my name's Joe Battiglieri. I'm uh, 34 years old. I was born in White Plains, New York. I'm an ex-Marine. Well, once a Marine, always a Marine. I'm currently a director of technology for a professional services firm in New York City, and I'm a die-hard metal fan. It was there for a lot of dark times in my life. Um, from the time I was 12 years old, metal was a, just a constant. And a lot of the lyrics spoke to me on a personal level about sticking to your guns and staying true to, to what you believe in. It's like a lifestyle music, you know? Everything else seems like people are like, oh yeah, I like it, I like it for a week, I lose interest, but metal, you know, it's metal fans love it forever. There's, I guess what, I, I'm not a casual person. When I like something, it's like real, and it's not casual music. Like no one goes, yeah, I was really big into Slayer one summer. You know, <laughs> there's no, like, I've never met that guy. <laughs> I've only met the guy who's got Slayer carved across his chest. No main veins, that's good. <laughs> no artillery will spray. If you listen to, like, the replacements or the Smiths or something when you're young, what it sort of says is, well, you feel weird and you feel different, but that's because you're smart. And this is like, this is, you're di you are different than these other people, but you should be happy with that. But metal really seemed to tell people that you feel weird, but you're not. That's why I was so interested in the idea of the KISS army. It was this idea that if you like KISS, that means like actually you're part of this massive like coven of people who have like the same values you have. KISS songs always seem to imply that as KISS fans, we're being somewhat persecuted for it. Like if you listen to the song Crazy Nights, it somehow implies people are trying to stop us from liking KISS, you know? And I think that's a really brilliant idea and I think that's part of the draw to metal. It makes people feel like it's, it's not a way to understand your loneliness. It's sort of a way to feel as though you are part of something that's larger than yourself because everything about metal is larger than it is in life. It gives them an alternative universe. It gives them a life of imagination through which they can view music. And it usually inspires a lot of them to pick up a guitar and start playing. <laughs> I'm 17, I'm from Riverside, California. I'm a bass player. You're also a student? I'm a student, yeah. <laughs> Metal in particular is yeah. does something for you. And, and what, what do you think that is? I, I couldn't get into other styles. I just couldn't relate to it. I, no matter how much I listened to it, you know, rap wasn't doing anything for me. Metal, when I listened to it, maybe it was because it's a little more angry. You know, I could relate to that. And I think that something that you have to really dig into to define has always really interested me. Because some things you scratch the surface and there it is. But with uh, metal, there's so many meanings to it, whether they be religious or just in life. I mean, there's something for everyone. Why is music so important to you? It's something that I can always count on. I mean, things in life, you know, they tend to like, it's a roller coaster, so sometimes things are good or bad. But I mean, whether you've had a good day or a bad day, you know, the music's going to be there for it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been very important. It really gets inside the mind of an eternal 15-year-old. If you ever lose that 15-year-old kid inside of you, then it won't make any sense at all. And people will start saying, uh, oh, yes, <laughs> well, that was, that was the part of my life. I'm, I'm really embarrassed about it all now. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I wore those stupid trousers and had that long hair. And it's just like, yeah, so you, you know, people are somehow ashamed of... Of, of what they what they were like when they were a kid. I still have people asking me nowadays, you know, aren't you ever gonna fucking outgrow that shit or, you know, the t-shirts? I'm like, fuck you. I wear these shirts because I like them, not because it's fucking popular. I, I'm who I am, and if, if that makes me a fucking dork or I'm not GQ or I'm not in vogue, I really couldn't fucking give two shits. It's outsider music and it's outsider subjects, and as a kid I was an outsider and a, the loner, and I think that that's sort of where it begins. You know, you just sort of get obsessed with weird, t you don't care about baseball, you're obsessed with the Manson family. Not because you think it's cool, because it certainly doesn't appear to be cool, because it's making you like the weird kid. Nobody's like going out, of, nobody wants to be the weird kid, you just somehow end up being the weird kid, you can't figure out how you got there. And um, you know, metal is sort of like that. <laughs> 
except it's like all the weird kids in one place. <laughs> I'm on my way to Vakken Open Air, the mecca of heavy metal culture. This is where 40,000 die-hard fans descend on a small town in northern Germany for four days of beer, debauchery, and heavy metal. But it's 2 a.m., we have no passes, and none of us speak a word of German. We're going to stay, we're going to sleep in the, uh, the lot. But with the power of charades, we managed to track down the festival organizer, Thomas Jensen. He gives us our passes and a bit of a hard time. Are you fucking crazy or what? In the middle of the night. We had a we had a very, very long, hard day. We lost some of our bags. Surprise, surprise. These are the festival grounds. Tomorrow, this place will come alive with metalheads, here to worship their metal gods. I'm in heaven. You understand me? I'm in fucking heaven. That's the way I like it, baby. I don't want to live forever. And don't forget the Joker. Mendras from Italy. Where are you guys from? From Italy. From Italy. From Italy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Salute. It's the morning of the first full day of music at Vakken. Already, the vast majority of fans are totally hungover, <laughs> including me. Looking pretty rough. Don't get too tight, eh? Jesus, cut me some slack here. Vakken is about more than just the music. It is a veritable feast of everything metal. Here you can find the metal market, metal breakfast, metal karaoke, you can even play a game of heavy metal foosball. Sweet. Can I play? Thank you. Black metal. Oh. Who's that? I want Dio. Oh. It should be like black, oh. black metal versus heavy metal. Wicked. Fans travel tens of thousands of miles from over 20 countries to be at Vakken. As an anthropologist, I'm here to explore the elements that unify this group of fans. The important thing about festivals is you can come here and get anything you want. Get your band shirts, get everything. Represent. This is the look, the image, this is the uniform. What makes metal a culture is, first is the music, no question about it. Secondly, uniform is the wrong word, but the, f the way you dress. People dress in a certain way and it mocks them immediately as metal fan. Black is really important. Leather is really important. Silver is good, you know, in studs. It's not real silver, it's nickel. Black in Western culture in general is a very interesting thing. It means of danger, it means evil, but also, again, of freedom. Outside of the light of day where people are not watching you. The kids who like metal look like they like metal. And now it's a little different, but there was a time like everyone had long hair, everyone was in black, everyone had tattoos. I mean, it was just funny, it was like, it's like an army of kids. Metal is unified by much more than the way the fans dress. Because mainstream support has come and gone over the past 35 years, metal is kept alive by a dedicated core of fans. They are the ones who publish magazines, program college radio shows, run independent record labels, and host news sites and chat rooms on the internet. The underground is, is just a network of friends. You know, just everyone who's participating. Other people help printing up t-shirts. Another one is driving, another kid is helping out his friends by, you know, coming along and helping load and unload the van, sell the t-shirt, it's a community. Yeah, you know, what is a desire, we have uh, three, three CDs out, also on vinyl, of course, two 
Metal for me is is a brotherhood. I think that's what keeps it alive. You know, we pass it on to our younger brothers. We pass it on to our friends. This is a way of life for me. I wake up, I've got Slayer on the stereo. Before I do anything, you know, some people wake up, they read the paper, they drink coffee. I listen to Slayer, I listen to Testament. It's, 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 I mean, it's in your blood. It's the air that you breathe. It's a substrata of society, as it were, because what attracts heavy metal fans to themselves is a tribal attitude. It's, let's go to a festival, let's enjoy ourselves, and the fact that the outside world doesn't actually understand is fantastic. Which is another thing that I love about it, is like, it's so fucking huge, yet it's like people, certain people don't even know it exists. <laughs> favorite bands. To see them in front of 40,000 people, it's a fucking dream come true. Were you? The Were best you show I've ever seen. I was in the pit. I was right in there. That was fucking awesome. That was fucking awesome. Bakken hosts a wide range of metal bands. For the outsider, it's hard to understand how all these bands fall under the same umbrella. Even for the die-hard metal fan, this gets complex, so you might want to take notes. The early metal bands, along with hard rock, shock rock, and punk, gave birth to an abundance of subgenres, each with their own distinct sound, lyrics, and look. These are power metal, the new wave of British heavy metal, progressive metal, glam metal, pop metal, stoner metal, hardcore, thrash metal, the first wave of black metal, Norwegian black metal, grindcore, death metal, Swedish death metal, metalcore, grunge, goth metal, industrial metal, hard alternative, new metal, and the new wave of American metal. But don't worry, I'm at Vakken to focus on the fans, not to meet with bands from every metal subgenre. There are a couple of bands, though, that I can't resist the opportunity to meet. We're at the gate. My first interview is with the Norwegian black metal band Mayhem, the most controversial group in the metal underground. The band's former vocalist blew his own brains out with a shotgun, and then his bandmates made necklaces from pieces of his skull. Warning, this interview gets a little weird. You know, we are pretty true to ourselves. We never bargain with our stuff, you know, we just release it. People don't like it, fuck them, you know. That's why we are here. Because Germany sucks for us. We are here to make, you know, a statement saying that, yeah, man, we rule. We are the fucking best metal band out there. If people don't recognize it, fuck them. We never negotiate or come to terms. Fuck you! You know what I mean? Can you repeat the question? A lot of people we've talked to have said that. What? I've said that black metal is starting to lose touch Who are they? with its roots. Which one? Who the fuck are you talking to? Fuck them, you know. Do you have any comments about that? Fuck that. Yeah, I have a comment. Fuck you, you know. Beer and interviews, not a good combination. But I know one guy who can deliver is Ronnie James Dio. He's the godfather of power metal metal's most over-the-top and fantastical subgenre. Think swords, sorcery, chivalry, and Dungeons and & Dragons, and you've got power metal. One of the things Ronnie is known for is inventing the devil horns, the most enduring symbol of heavy metal culture. I'm of Italian extraction, and uh, my grandmother and my grandfather on both sides, both my mother's and father's side, came to America uh, from Italy, and they had superstitions. And I would always see my grandmother when I was a little kid, you know, with her holding my hand and walking down the street. And she would see someone and go, what's that? And eventually learned that it was called the Maloik. 
and the Malik was, someone's giving us the evil eye, so she's giving it protection against the evil eye. Or you can give someone the evil eye too. So invent it, no, but perfect it and make it important, yes, because I did it so much, especially within the confines of that great band, Sabbath, which had this incredible name already, and you put that together with uh, what people think it is. But for me, because I'm lucky enough to have kind of uh, just have done it so much, it's been more equated with me than anyone else. Although Gene Simmons will tell you that he invented it, but then again, Gene invented breathing and shoes and everything, you know. What makes metal unique? What makes the fans and the culture of metal unique, do you think? Well, I think it's probably more than anything the fact that it becomes a great big family of people who all share one thing, and that is metal. They <laughs> just yeah. love it, and it's really them against the world. It really is, and I think that's that's its its importance, and that's why it lasts so long. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ronnie. Clear from my experience here that heavy metal shares something with all cultures, a sense of belonging to a way of life. And now that I've explored the roots of metal and what it means to its fans, it's time to turn my attention to why metal has provoked such strong negative reactions in people. Why has heavy metal been consistently stereotyped, dismissed, and condemned? Is there anybody with better lyrics than Lemmy? His opening line on that masterpiece is, if you squeeze my lizard, how can you not love Lemmy? We have Sam Dunn in the studio with us. Sam has been traveling around the world making a documentary on heavy metal. Welcome to New York, Sam. We hear you're just back from the Wacken Festival in Germany. That must have been a blast. I always wanted to check that out myself. Real quick, is there anybody that completely <laughs> Your favorite interview so far? That's hard to choose, but I have to say, probably, given my long history as a fan of the music, Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden, we got to interview him right on the stage of the Hammersmith Odeon wow. uh, with the balcony in the background, and it was totally amazing. And we hear you're going to interview Dee Snyder tomorrow. Dee's always a blast to talk to and always outspoken. Make sure you say hello for me. Some parents in the 1980s, Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister was the most dangerous guy on the planet. This was when metal met its first organized attack. Twisted Sister and eight other metal bands were placed on a list called the Filthy 15 because their music was deemed offensive by the Parents Music Resource Center. Dee Snyder was summoned to testify before the US Congress to defend his music and his livelihood. '84 was a, a pretty insane time for Twisted Sister. We were hearing bits and pieces about this Parents Music Resource Center and Tipper Gore, but not really registering because we were getting protests and, and religious groups at every show. So just another parent group that you know was putting Twisted Sister on a, on a, tar a list of targets. We have always. Uh, talked about the positive aspects of the music industry, but of course the highlight has been on the excesses that have been allowed to develop as we have tried to focus our concern on those excesses. Somebody approached our office that they want the Senate committee is having a hearing on censorship with the PMRC and wanted to know if I would come and speak. Now my view of it when I heard it was they want me to carry the flag into battle. Hell yeah. Braveheart, baby. Braveheart wasn't even out, but that sort of mentality. Give me the fucking flag, man. Let's go. I knew that they were, like everybody else, grossly underestimating me. 
I knew that they viewed me as just another dunderheaded rocker, and they would bring me in, make me look like a fool, and I would help their cause. They did not know that I could construct a sentence and speak English fluently. And I'm there in my cut-off denim, my skin-tight jeans, my snakeskin boots, and a little bit of eye makeup left underneath, and my big hair. And I ain't getting dressed up for nobody. I'm a dirtbag, and I'm proud. And I play in these people like, you know, I mean, I've been, you know, mentally, I'm setting these guys up for the kill. I have got my speech in my back pocket, which I have worked on for a few weeks and honed and refined till it's a freaking nuclear weapon. Fold it up like a gazillion times, like a bad kid bringing his homework to school. You know, when I open it up and I'm flattening it out on the table, really delivered, and they're going, oh man, this guy, this is a lamb being brought to the slaughter. And I start reading. Since I seem to be the only person addressing this committee today who has been a direct target of accusations from the presumably responsible PMRC, I would like to use this occasion to speak on a more personal note and show just how unfair the whole concept of lyrical interpretation and judgment can be and how many times this can amount to little more than character assassination. And I am just tearing apart everything that they've accused me of, disproving without beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything they've accused me of has been wrong, false, and they are scrambling, scrambling, scrambling. They were saying that Under the Blade was about sadomasochism and bondage. It was about my guitar player's throat operation. It's not uh, really a, uh, a wild a leap of the imagination to jump to the conclusion that that's about something other than uh, surgery or hospitals, uh, neither of which are mentioned in the song. No, it's not a wild jump, and I think uh, I, what I said in one part was that songs allow a person to put their own imagination, experiences, and dreams into the lyrics. Uh, people can interpret it many ways. Uh, Ms. Gore was looking for sadomasochism and bondage, and she found it. Someone looking for surgical references would have found it as well. Yeah. I said, you know, I can't help that Tipper Gore's got a dirty mind, and, and Al Gore just, oh my God, you know, he really jumped over the table. They were saying, we're not going to take it, what should be on the filthy 15 for violence, and it was no more violent than the Declaration of Independence. The PMRC rated songs according to violence, the occult, sex, drugs, and alcohol. And although Dee Snyder talked about throat operations and standing up for your rights, most